Um, so we are going to be uh, kicking off a sort of micro Sunday school series here on the days of creation. We're going to do that for the rest of the month of January. That gives us three Sundays to deal with that. Uh, the big ticket item that I want to go ahead and put forward to you is what we're going to be starting in February. And that's going to take up most of the semester. So we're going to be doing uh, Shepherding a Child's Heart. Have any of you heard of that book by Ted Tripp? Of several of you? It's a wonderful book. Uh, it goes beyond sort of just legalistically telling your kids don't do this do that and, or the other side of you know let them do whatever let them explore who they are it talks about how we can properly uh, parenting ultimately is about shepherding that heart getting that child to come to a relationship with christ and to obey out of a desire to please the lord and so it's a wonderful wonderful book it's a wonderful series uh, we're going to be doing that as i said for the lion's share of our semester but for these three weeks we're going to be doing that creation so when we talk about creation, we're really talking about Genesis 1 and 2, and there has been historically lots of questions about uh, creation, uh, especially in the last hundred years or so. Uh, how did God do it? You know, what, do, what do those passages mean? What is, the, uh, uh, what is in those passages? All these things um, are vitally important, and there are questions that have been asked. So we're going to go ahead and unpack those uh, over the course of the next few weeks. By necessity, this is only going to be an overview, a brief overview. I mean, if I did a really, 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 really brief overview, we can do it in one day, and I can just say, here are the issues, boom, 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 and list them. But I would take the time just listing the issues. So at best here, we're going to get into just looking at these things and giving some short answers, just so you are familiar. If we did this as a whole semester, then we'd be able to dive a little deeper into it. But hopefully this will at least get familiarize yourself with some of the things that are going on uh, when we talk about the days of creation and that's really what most people are asking about the days is it is it six days that are 24 hours long or is it a longer period those are the things that people worry about but there's so much more in the creation account uh, especially the very fact that it comes right at the very beginning and sets the stage for the entirety of what we have in the bible so that's what we're going to be doing over the next several weeks any questions before we launch or any comments no, nope, all good. All right. Well, probably the very best thing that we can do is crack open our Bibles and uh, take a look right there in Genesis 1.1. One, one. I'm going to start at the beginning. And um, one thing I want you to notice, we're going to read the first two chapters there's some questions that we want to think about as we're reading. So let me mention the questions first, then we'll read it, then we'll address what we want to, uh, want to look at. We want to ask the question, what is the genre of these two chapters? You know, we talk about genres, is it drama, is it fiction, is it history, is it poetry, uh, you know, is it allegory, those kind of things. We want to be able to answer the question, what is the genre of Genesis 1 and 2? Uh, then we want to look at some other things. To whom was this originally written? Like all things in the Bible, it applies to all people and all ages, and yet the best way to understand how to apply it to all people and all ages is to understand to whom it was originally written, what was the purpose for which it was written by Moses, and once we get that answer, we'll be able to, uh, to dive in a little deeper. Undoubtedly, there will be some much more um, uh, basic questions that will come to your mind as you read through it, and we want to go ahead and explore those. But, yeah, to whom was it written? Why was it written to them? What was the purpose? So with that, you'll also notice that there are two accounts of creation in Genesis. Uh, the second one is in chapter 2, starting in verse 4. And it's really, um, uh, some people say it's a competing um, account of creation it's not it's really just an expansion of the creation of man it kind of zooms in and gives us a bit more detail so um, you'll need to notice that as we read all right could i have somebody read the first chapter through the second chapter the first three verses so genesis 1 1 through 2 3 if i can have somebody read that and then somebody pick up from chapter 2 verse 4 through the end of chapter 2 have any volunteers for those and you'll do the first one? Yes, please. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, 
in darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the day, uh, the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, and he separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the day of the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And he saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees saying fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so, and God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great uh, sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, to every de everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so, and God saw himself, everything that he had made. Behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, and the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Right, one more That's wonderful. Thank you. Maybe we can get somebody to read then from 2 4 through the end of the chapter. I'll do it. It's, uh, it's going to be New King, New King James, Ooh. which is close to ESV. Unless you want someone to read from ESV. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. 
before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Bishon, and is the one which skirts the whole land of Babylon, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. The Delim and the Onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon, and it was the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hittigal, and it is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep him. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper or comfortable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God from every beast of the field and every bird of the air brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made it to a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. All right. Thank you both for reading that. This is where we're going to be focusing over the next few weeks, so we'll always have that text in front of us. All right, before we jump into it and start uh, learning what we see there, what are some things, some observations that come to mind as you've read both chapters back to back? Anything that just comes to mind? It's not very popular now. I'm sorry? It's not very popular now. Not very popular now. Now, I'm going to... But why is that? I, I wonder, that's what I'm really interested in. Why would it not be popular? It's so intolerant. How dare you tell somebody they can only have a man and a woman in America? Ah, you're talking about the man and woman being married, and, and that is not popular. Yes, absolutely. I was going to say there may be some other reasons why the creation account as a whole is not too popular. Um, sure, like the other 50 some odd genders where they can that, yeah, it doesn't explain the, uh, the other 50-odd genders, right? 5,000. 5,000. 5, okay, we're expanding. How the church does it like to uh, buck the system these days? And uh, the fact that the church would have to uh, um, really grind against and promote the populist idea of creation is, is something that has uh, uh, not settled well with a lot of uh, preachers these days. Okay, so you're saying the church is, is, doesn't like to buck the system anymore, likes to be uh, viewed favorably. You may, may, may not have used that language, but viewed favorably by the world, and so it's going to not insist. What all of you are implying, though, is that Genesis 1 and 2 make certain truth claims. Would you agree with that? There are certain things that are being said, and there are claims that are being made here. Uh, and we, we want to be highlighting what those are, and we want to be understanding what they are. Uh, and especially understanding what they're not, because sometimes we read more into them than that's actually there. But what's behind all this is this idea that there is actual truth in this passage, claims being made, many of which, yes, do run counter to uh, popular thought and wisdom uh, nowadays. Anything else that comes to mind? That's all good. Brandon? It doesn't say anything about uh, the evolution of the development of creatures and 
how could a supposed complete story not address that? Okay, so it doesn't talk about evolution, you say, or any kind of um, uh, the, the development of the animals? For the most part, that's true. That's true. So what does that mean? What does that mean that it doesn't mention that? Yeah, so it's an excuse to discredit it. Let's, let's take a look at that. I want to look at that because there are folks who look at this passage and still very much hold to evolution, what they now call theistic evolution, evolution that's guided by God. So we're going to see if that's a tenable position. Others? Lang. This is going beyond the text says. It seems to indicate that there's a like, pre-fall that the, the God gave man food by the way of plants as well as animals, by the way, of plants. that go beyond the text of the Palestinian? It doesn't go beyond the text. It's right in there. Okay. It, gives the, it gives man uh, the plants. It gives animals plants. So was everybody vegetarian? That's what it seems to Yeah. And then that, that brings up some deeper questions. If there were no meat eaters, then what were these animals like? What did fish eat in the water? Did they not eat other fish? Did they just eat kelp? Was everybody vegan? Does everybody have long stringy hair and sallow and pallid faces? I mean, you know, but it said it was paradise. So uh, these are all really good questions. And what's really being asked here is, is there death before the fall? And if there is death before the fall, what kind of death? Okay, I'll leave room for one more uh, observation. Does Lang's suggestion add any significance to the fact that God made uh, clothing out of skin for them? The, the, the animal would not have been sacrificed to eat that. The animal would have only been sacrificed for covering her. That could very well be. And since that happens post-fall, we don't get a clear answer. The animal clearly is killed to make the skins for Adam and Eve after the fall, after their sin. Yes, would it, would it have been okay? Was it the fact that they had to die itself the biggest issue, or was it just that they died to clothe them as opposed to feeding them? Those are all very good questions. As we come to the text, the kind of questions that most people have fall under a couple of categories. The first one is, what are the days? What is signified by the days? Uh, and, and, and it was the first day, you know, morning, uh, and, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. What does that mean? You know, that's the, one of the big questions that most people have. And the second question is, what data, what information is Genesis 1 and 2 telling me about creation? What things can I mine from it? So those are the things that most people are curious about. We are going to address them. But today, and by the way, my watch finally died. Its battery died, so I don't have a watch. So either you tell me or I'm just going to go until who knows when. Um, I just figure you're giving me the freedom to just keep talking. But um, what we're going to do today is we're going to answer those very important preliminary questions about the text itself as a whole. Because once we figure out the genre of it, once we figure out some of the key reasons why Moses wrote it and to whom he wrote it and so on, then, then we can begin to get those details. If we just jump into the text and start saying, okay, here's a scientific account that's going to give us details about what day the sun was made and the details of that, then we're not going to be able to properly get what we need out of it. So let's begin with genre, right? There's a lot of question about the genre. Now, the funny thing is, all these questions began in the very late 19th century, early 20th century, when the critical movement began. That's the one that in seminaries, and then ultimately later in pulpits, it was the idea that the Bible was not really an inerrant, infallible book, uh, where the Holy Spirit inspired uh, these authors to write exactly what God wanted, but it was just an another book written by men, and could be treated like, uh, like anything else. You can pick up a, uh, you know, the Iliad, you can pick up uh, something by Nathaniel Hawthorne and you can uh, study those books in the same way you can pick up the Bible and study that and you can figure out certain things. So that, that, that critical mindset of reading the Bible where we no longer let the Bible read us and judge us but we're the ones who read and judge was legitimate. And that started about 120 years ago, 130 years ago. Um, so the question of genre for Genesis really begins then. And some of the biggest things that we've looked at is some people look at it and say, well, it's simply myth. It's just legend. And if it's legend, if it's myth, what are the repercussions of that? 
Say again? Then it's not the truth. Then it's not the truth. At least it's not historical. It may contain some le level of truth, like all legends and myths. It may be trying to communicate some spiritual truth uh, or reality. But if it's simply legend or myth, we cannot take um, as historical the idea of, you know, like, for example, we haven't gotten there, but in Genesis 3, the idea that a serpent actually comes and talks to Adam and Eve, or that um, things are created the way we read about in the first two chapters. Those are just then uh, allegories or, you know, just mythic and elements. So that's one of the real dangers that comes with that, and there are many people who believe that that is, in fact, what this book is. Uh, other people then look at this and say, well, what we have here is poetry. So it's true, but it's poetic. And because it's written in, in poetic form, then like all poetry, it takes license. Um, uh, so the first one, oh, by the way, I didn't dismiss the first one, but let me just dismiss it right now and say that within um, our circles, uh, one of the things that we insist on, for example, in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, as well as other uh, conservative reformed groups like our former denomination, the PCA, or the uh, United Reformed Churches, and those churches, we all insist that these are historical chapters, that what we're reading here is real history. Uh, now, what that means and how that's played, we're going to talk about, but it is real history. So that's the first thing to answer the whole myth and legend thing. As we move on, though, the poetry thing is another thing that's often offered. But uh, uh, when you look at it, no, it's not poetry either. It's not poetry like you might get in the Psalms or even in Proverbs. Uh, it's not the kind of poetry you have sometimes in the prophets. What you have here is prose. So it is prose, but it's an exalted prose, and it's a narrative prose. So for us to be able to understand the genre, we have real history being written here. It is in prose, not in poetry. It, is an, it uses it as exalted language, but that's only because, stop and think about it, it's because of the subject matter. The creation of the world is an exalted event, and so the language is grand. But in and of itself, it's not poetic. And that means that what it says, it's not taking poetic license. It's not using metaphor. You know, when the, when the psalm says the trees of the field will clap their hands, most of us understand genre. And so we realize that because it's a song and, you know, the trees of the field will clap their hands, we know that trees don't really have hands. They don't really clap. We understand that uh, metaphorically. If we were to import that into Genesis, we'd get ourselves into trouble. No, it's not poetic in that form. It is exalted and beautiful. Poetry is often exalted itself, but this is exalted prose. It is historical, and it means what it says. So there's a sense in which we can use the word literal, but one of the things I want us to learn about in the next several weeks is what literal actually means. And it may not mean what you think it means. And we maybe want to distinguish between literal and literalistic. Right? Literalistic is the one that says the trees of the field will clap their hands and <gasps> the Bible says it. Those are their trees really do grow hands and they really clapped back in the old days. Something must have happened in the in the two thousand year in the three thousand years since David wrote that trees lost their hands and let's study that. That's being literalistic. Most I haven't found anybody going that far, but that's how that goes. Literal means that you read it as it was intended by the author. So when you pick up a newspaper, you pick up the Wall Street Journal or the uh, what do we have here in Dallas Morning News, um, and you read a news story, you expect <laughs> you expect that it's telling you something that actually happened, right? <laughs> you can read into that all you want. Uh, um, when you pick up a children's story, right, we had our evening of the arts, and Chelsea, you stood up here and read where the wild things are. If you expected that to be read like the same way that you might, well, it is both fiction when you read the paper and when you know, but you get the idea. You, know, you expect it to be different. The genres are different. You have different expectations, and yet you can literally understand what Chelsea was saying when she read where the wild things are because we understood the genre and what the author intended, that this is a kid's story. So when we use the word literal like that, that's what we're getting at. We're getting at the fact that we're reading it as was intended. When we read the trees of the field will clap their hands, literally we're talking about the joy that the creation has in its creator and that it joins with us and we join with it. But we know that in actuality trees are not clapping. Mia, you look like you are ready to launch a question or an observation or you're deep in thought. Yeah. Deep in thought, okay. If I got you to get to this point, then that means we're doing something right. Okay, where are we on time? Somebody uh, spot me on that? 
942. Okay, so our time is beginning to wind down. Let's make some other observations. So what we're uh, saying here is that we've got exalted prose. Uh, uh, yeah, ex I was going to say, I was going to correct myself. I know that's what I wanted. Exalted prose. And it's prose narrative. Now, who wrote this passage? Do we know? Not a trick question. Moses. Moses. Okay, so this is part of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Uh, these are all written uh, within a very short span of time. Moses wasn't there. So did God sit there and tell him and say, I want you to write these things down? It's possible. They also may have been accounts that came down over the ages, which then God said, eh, you got most of it right. Here's some, you know, here's the actual detail. We don't really know. What we do know, as we understand the inspiration of Scripture, is that however it came to be, what he's writing is exactly what God wants us to communicate. But it is important to understand, even though we recognize that the Spirit is the ultimate author and that this applies to all people in all ages because it is God's word to us, it is important for us to better understand it, to recognize who wrote it, when, and to whom. So Moses wrote it. When did he write this? Anybody know? Shortly after 14, in the 40 years after 1445 B.C., give or take. That's right. So the Exodus happens around 1446 B.C. You're, man, you had that within a year. That's pretty good. So 1446 and then 40 years in the wilderness and he dies. So somewhere in that 40 years, it's a relatively short time span. He writes all five of these books. Why would he be writing it? And to who, no, let's ask the question, to whom is he writing it? Israel, and just Israel in general, where's Israel in this moment in its life? Wandering the wilderness, redeemed. This, this is redeemed Israel straight from uh, Egypt in the wilderness because of their own sin, sinful rebellion. They're being weeded out, they're being prepared, they're being refined so they might take um, ownership of the promised land. So we probably need to be writing these down, right? That's the whole reason why I had this up there. So the who, Moses, to redeemed, and this is so important, redeemed Israel. Remember, the Exodus is the redemptive event par excellence in the Old Testament. It is the picture of God rescuing his people, and it would not be superseded. You'll see all the Old Testament looking back to the Exodus. It would not be superseded until the cross. The cross is the superlative redemptive event in the whole of the Bible, but in the Old Testament, it's Exodus. So it's being written to a people who are freshly redeemed, who've been brought out. So the when, sometime between 1446 and 1406 B.C., 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Now here's the real question. Why? Why is this being written? In order to answer that, let's go to the next book, Exodus. The Exodus tells us about the Exodus and how God worked to get the people out. Those people had just lived through this. So this is a book saying, this is what God did for you. I'm putting it down here. I'm reminding you, this is what God did for you and how he brought you out by his strength, by his might, how he redeemed you, how he made you his own people, how he brought you out to worship him. Then he gives the tabernacle instructions. Here's where you're going to meet him and worship. The book of Leviticus then says, here's how you're going to worship with these kind of priests and these kind of sacrifices and this kind of lifestyle. And then the book of Numbers covers the time in the wilderness. So it was written a little later. Here's how you screwed everything up. God redeemed you and you still mess everything up. And yet God is patient and he sanctifies you and he refines you. You can see how all this, Paul tells us, is a picture of our own spiritual lives. He continues to work with us, sanctifying us and preparing us so when we can finally enter into the promised land. And Deuteronomy is just the second giving of the law where it finally says, now that you're ready to enter into the promised land, here's what a redeemed people live like. So we understand that. Where does Genesis comes in? Genesis comes in to say, 
God didn't just show up one day in Egypt and say, I'm going to pick these people. There had been a promise made to you from the very beginning. God has been at work in the lives of your ancestors, you, you Jews that have been redeemed. God has been at work from the very beginning, and not just with Abraham. It goes all the way back to the creation, the beginning of the world. So the whole setting of the book of Genesis uh, is within that greater picture of God redeeming a people for himself, making them his special people, having those people behave and live in certain ways, and he is going to bless them. And they will be in that regard different and separate from the rest of the world. And the whole history of the patriarchs which is really the, the bulk of the book of Genesis, is to show that God had picked this people from long before, and what he did in Egypt in rescuing them was simply part of that broader plan. And what he did with the patriarchs was really just a narrowing of the promise that he gave to Adam and Eve, that he would rescue them from the fall, from the way that they had messed everything up. And that means that the first two chapters of Genesis set the stage within that redemptive context. Does that make sense? That matters because there's different ways, and I'm going to, either I can erase this or I'll just say some things and you keep them in your mind. Are we good with erasing this? Okay. All this matters because we often approach those first two chapters as if they stood alone, as if they were somehow divorced and they were given to us as a, as a scientific text or something. So there are some approaches that people have to those first creation accounts. One is pure, this may be too light to see, purely religious. Now, um, uh, the purely religious is, um, hey, it, it communicates no real information about uh, uh, about creation. Now this can be a more progressive or a more conservative. On the more liberal side is, hey, it's just myth, you know, and you can just ignore it. Others say, no, it's not myth. It's, it's Again, it's poetic. It's this and that. But in no way is trying to convey anything historical other than spiritual truths. They both say, even though they may be coming at it from two different views of Scripture, they both end up saying that it's nothing more than a, a religious account. It doesn't contain any actual truth about creation. And that's a wrong approach to take, as we already looked at just by looking at the genre. But the other wrong approach, which is the one where a lot of evangelicals fall into, is to see it as a scientific text. To see it as primarily there to give us the details and to satisfy our curiosity about the details of how God created and both of those approaches get us into trouble. A lot of us are here, and we spend a whole lot of time trying to match every detail in Genesis with something that we've studied or whatever. And the minute that you deviate from that, in today's evangelical world, uh, the, the first thought is, uh-oh, you're not taking the Bible seriously. You're not taking the Bible seriously, which is not true. So what I want us to do over the next several weeks in reform circles, there has been a spectrum of different views that are permitted. It's not a huge spectrum. It doesn't include things like evolution or this idea of myth. But there is a spectrum. And I want us to explore that spectrum because when I put out some things and say, not everybody, for example, believes that the days of creation are six days of 24 hours as we define 24 hours today, the first thought you might think, oh, our pastors and, and elders in the OPC or in the PCA or in the URC, are they all liberal? Are they going liberal? And that's because we've been fed a steady diet probably for about 40 years now that insists that only the six-day, 24-hour view is the only biblical view. And I want us to show, I want you guys to see that, no, there is a broader spectrum. It's not huge. doesn't encompass all the silly stuff that's out there. But it is broader than just that. Now, you might still hold a six-day, 24-hour view. I'm not going to knock that view at all. Uh, but I simply want us to see that many of us are here, and any kind of deviation from what we think should be the case is not necessarily something that's unbiblical. Does that make sense? Okay. So what does the text tell us? I do want to say some things before we quit for today. 
there are some truths that really stand out as we go through it. We've read the account, you, you read the language, okay, thank you, and certain things should have popped out at you. There are three things, and let's just take Genesis 1 for now. Genesis 2 is a, a, sort of unpacks the creation of man in particular and, and shows some, some things that we do want to get to. Let's just take Genesis 1. Several things stand out. Remember that there were a number of pagan myths about creation. And you can look at the Babylonian and the Assyrian and all the Egyptians. All those existed at the time when Moses wrote. And they all have, and if we had time, we would look at that and how the goddess Tiamat, this is the, uh, the Babylonian when the goddess Tiamat got into a battle with this person and that other God and the gods, you know, all fought amongst themselves to create and all this and and uh, you know the uh, the blood of, of of one god and, and a big god war fell on the earth and from that sprang human beings and all sorts of things like that that you can read about. It's funny you can look at all these different myths from these different cultures and they all some sound somewhat alike. The creation account in Genesis is completely different. It's the only one that does several things. The first thing that it does is that it shows the nature of God. It deals with the nature of God. Right from the very beginning, it establishes that there is one God. Not a bunch of warring deities, not a bunch of weak deities. There is this one God who is all-powerful, who is sovereign over his creation, who's not responding to the pre-existing creation. He himself creates all things out of nothing. And we'll defend that statement a little bit because there are people who are assaulting and have been assaulting the idea of creation out of nothing, even now increasingly in evangelical uh, uh, theology. And that's because evangelicalism has grown very weak in the last 50 years. Uh, it's either become very anti-intellectual, this is just a broader comment in which to place everything, broader, uh, much more anti-intellectual. I don't want to hear anything about science. I, it's just wrong. If they say anything, scientists are wrong because they're wrong about evolution, they're wrong about abortion, so they're wrong about everything. Or the flip side is, I want to be accepted by the world. And we see that in almost all the seminaries now are accredited by uh, 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 secular accrediting agencies. And that brings a lot of oversight and a lot of demands. And so a lot of even, like, for example, I could never teach in a seminary because you must have a PhD. So we're playing by all their rules and that kind of thing. And so that has an effect. And you see more and more evangelical writers willing to give a little bit, like on the date of Exodus, by the way. This is a little sideline. Date of Exodus, 1446. Liberals have made a push to push that back 200 years. I won't get into all the reasons here. Uh, 50 years ago, we were all saying, that's stupid. You can read what the text says. Paul says, 430 years. Go on from this point to that point. So it has to be, and liberals say, yeah, but archaeological evidence says this and this and that. Now I see evangelicals saying, well, it's a toss-up. It's a toss-up between the two dates. And it's not a toss-up. It's either the Bible or archaeological evidence, and we could be reading archaeological evidence wrong. We could be misreading the Bible. The Bible's not wrong, but we could be misreading it. This one's a pretty plain one. So you're seeing more and more of that. Um, so it's important for then us to recognize, getting back to what is the Bible actually, what Genesis 1 actually telling us? It's telling about the nature of God, this one God, sovereign over all things, created ex nihilo, which means out of nothing, despite the fact that some folks are challenging that today. So it's a, a majestic God, not some weak deities fighting amongst themselves and creation comes out of some fight or, you know, or whatever. That's the first thing it tells us. Second thing is the role of man. And yes, I'm going to use the word man. Very politically incorrect. I can't help myself. Uh, so we're, the role of man. Man is central, central in this account. He is the crown of creation. In all the mythological and pagan myths of creation, man is an afterthought. Man is the leftovers. Man is a mistake or an accident or a punishment for the earth. Not so in this account. Man is at the very center. He is made in the image of God. He is exalted, not as exalted as God, but he is an exalted creation, the crown of creation. And the last thing we see, even though it's not explicit in, um, in chapter 1, the fall is our fault. In all the other creation myths, the world that's created is an imperfect world with conflict and everything that we see today. They're trying to explain why everything is messed up. 
That's not the case here. Everything is good. When we read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, then we realize we're the ones who messed up creation. But these are the three very important truths that you find right in Genesis 1. This is what Moses is trying to communicate. Moses is not concerned, as we're going to see, to satisfy 20th century, 21st century uh, views on uh, DNA or um, you know, evolution or any of those things. I'm not saying they're unimportant. I'm not saying the text doesn't speak to it, and we're going to deal with that. But this is what it's trying to do. It's right from the very beginning setting the tone for who God is, who we are, and why we're in the situation that we're in. Does that make sense? Questions about any of that? This is, the, this is the, the payoff pitch for today. This is what the book is about, or those chapters are about. All good? Okay, that's probably, how much time do I probably have? Like mere minutes, two minutes? Okay. No questions? And that'll be forever recorded, uh, and we'll all know. I won't mention who it was that did that. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> all right. So good. Let's go ahead and close. What we're going to do next week, why don't you spend some time this week reading those accounts again, looking at it along these lines, not... You know, we're, how did the plants, and oh, wait a minute, the sun is on the fourth day, so how can plants have been on the third day? Well, that's, and all that. Just read it from this perspective and think about the broader arc. This is a people that have just been redeemed, and God is telling them, I have been God to all mankind from the very beginning. You all messed it up. I'm stepping in, and I'm redeeming you, and I'm making you my own people. And read those first two chapters and see how that falls into place. See what else you can gather. And then next week, we're going to begin to look at the different views of the days of creation and so on, and we're going to begin to unpack those. Is that good? All right, let's go ahead and close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful and majestic account in the first two chapters of how you created us, how you created the whole of the world. And what we read is mind-boggling and staggering. It's, it's so majestic in its scope, the, the grandeur of it, even today. Even the most pagan uh, um, critic recognizes just how exalted this text is and really how exalted you are, O oh God. The God who is sufficient in and of himself, who just exists, who is the I am, who I am, who's... Creation is distinct from the Creator, who doesn't need the creation, but out of His goodness has created. Father, we see this here. We're humbled by it. We're humbled by the fact that you made us a central part of your creation, that you made us to be viceroys, viziers, as it were, or vice regents, whatever term we want to use. You're number two, the lieutenants who would run the creation in your place. And even though we haven't read the fall, we already know how messed up things are and we realize this was not your doing. You created a world that in the end you declared very good. It's our doing that the world is messed up. It's our rebellion and our sin. And so even from chapter one, we've already established the need for a Christ who would come and redeem. We pray, Lord, as we now read this text anew and afresh, that we would see that and that we would see Jesus already even here. He who would become the second Adam, who would usher in a new creation, a creation which we long for, as Romans 8 says, for the day in which he returns. We thank you that you have begun that creation in us already, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17. It is a spiritual creation, and we long for the day in which it is physical as well. Until then, Father, help us to read your word, to be encouraged by it and strengthened for, uh, by it so we can move forward. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.